I was having a hard time gathering my thoughts on what to speak on for the past couple weeks, and God wasn't giving me anything. And then God woke me up, um, I think it was Saturday morning, Saturday morning at 3 a.m. Normally when he wakes me up at 3 a.m. is to pray uh, or write something down. But I'm sitting there on the edge of my bed, 3 a.m., waiting for God to, okay, God, you got me, you gave me something. Okay, what is it? What is it? And he was like, nothing, just go back to sleep. I'm like, why did you wake me up then if you ain't going to give me nothing? Um, because he usually he gives me something. He told me, go back to sleep. What you're going to speak on, I'll give it to you later that day. So yesterday, Apostle Kenny and I, we were in a, a branding meeting for Hope Nation. Because, you know, we want to make sure that we're representing God properly, uh, making sure the vision is being cast out, not just here in our physical gatherings with the signage that you see out front, but... Uh, or in our sermons, but also like on the website, on social media, um, when we encounter people face to face, when we're doing evangelism, uh, in the future when we're passing out publication for people and taking, you know, official pictures, because a picture speaks a thousand words, and you can look at a photo of a pastor and his wife, and you can tell a lot about the ministry and we don't want to be like hey let's just take pictures but what's the vision that we're casting out when we take pictures yeah. there's more to it than getting dolled up and get the camera ready and smile but what's the vision um so some of the some of the questions that was asked during that branding meeting was you know who is hope nation what are we about who are we for? Where are we going three, five, ten years from now? Why Hope Nation? Why do we want people to come to this ministry? Why do we want people to join and not just be a member, but be a partner, be a part of the vision and what God is doing? And the reoccurring theme that we were talking about yesterday was authenticity and being commissioned. Um, doing what the Lord has sent us to do, not just simply obeying his word, but doing what he has sent us to do. So yesterday, God gave me John chapter 5, verse 19. So let's go there. So to give a background, Jesus, he healed the man at the pool on the Sabbath day. And it was against their law. Not God's law, but it was against their man-made law. And so the Jews, they wanted Jesus to stop. And Jesus said to them, my father never stops working. And so I work too. At this point, they were determined to kill Jesus. They said that he was making himself equal with God. So let's go to verse 19. And Jesus answered and said to them, <laughs> Amen. Jesus answered and said to them, I assure you and I say it to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. The Son does the same things that the Father does. Verse 20, for the, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel and be amazed. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Verse 22, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Sent him. The Father, he sent his Son. He entrusted Jesus to judge. To send is to authorize or direct, to go and act, go forth. To send is also to commission. 
Now we just had our commissioning service the beginning of this month, and I asked my husband, why that word? Why are you always using different words than what we've been growing up to use? <laughs> like, are you like purposely just trying to get rid of your closure groups or what? Because I've grown up church, yeah, I'm used to the ordination service or installation service. So why commission? So commission, commission. Commission is the act of committing. It's doing. Sending to the act of entrusting as a charge, as a duty, is given to a person as his warrant for exercising certain powers or the performance of any duty. It's a charge, an order, a mandate, or any authority given. So we've all have been commissioned. We've all been sent by um, our Father to do what he has told us to do. Not just simply, you know, obey him, but do what he has sent us to do. Yes. So the last time I spoke was in March. Um, I spoke from chapter 1 of James, so let's go there. James chapter 1. Oh, look at you. Amen. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what God's teaching says. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a, a man observing his natural face in a mirror. Verse 24, for he observes himself, he goes away and immediately forgets how bad he looks. But he who looks intentionally and to the perfect law of liberty that sets people free and continues in it by not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will have God's blessing in what they do. So we don't want to just hear the word, but we also want to act upon it, apply it to our lives. Those who deceive themselves, they're more than just hypocrites. Hypocrites, they live in contradiction to their beliefs. They have a false appearance. But those who deceive themselves, they are in danger of being blind. They're led astray by false thinking and enticing words. And there's a lot out there, especially with COVID, there's like more out there because like everybody's online. Everybody's on social media, everybody's on YouTube. And a lot of people are saying things that, ooh, no, that sounds good, but is it really good? Yeah. Does it line up to God's teaching? Does it line up to his word? Because people nowadays, they don't want to hear sound teaching. Mm -hmm. That's why certain churches are filled up, because all they do is hoop and holler, and their ears are just itching and tingling to what sounds good, what feels good, but what about sound doctrine? They want the feel-good messages that says, you know, do what you want. Live any way that you want to at home and, and still come to church. Jesus still loves you, but they don't want the truth. So what do they do? They wander off, they're led astray into delusion yeah. because they don't want any conviction from Holy Spirit. How does that how does listening to the word causes us to go down that path of deception? Well, when we're not rooted in the things of God and in his word, it's easy for something to come along and just cause us to be easily moved. Matthew 24 tells us, take heed that no man deceive us. There are false Christs out there. There are false prophets out there that's they're just rising up and they're performing great signs and they're doing great wonders, but they're even leading the very elect astray. We're not to take part in the unfruitful works of darkness, yes. but instead we're supposed to expose them. They appear to be godly, but they deny the power, the power that God gives us by telling us what to do through his word. They are spiritual, but they don't want to be biblical. There's a difference. There's a lot of people out there that are very spiritual, but or what you're doing is it found in the word of God. Yes. God tells us to avoid such people. 
So how are we observing ourselves in the mirror, but still going away immediately forgetting how bad we look? So in James chapter one, it talks about the mirror and the mirror is there for a reason. It's more than just a piece of glass. You know, naturally if I'm looking in the mirror and I see something out of place, I'm going to adjust myself, right? Based off what my grandmother taught me growing up. Like you're a lady, you show up your shape, but leave something for your husband to see when you get married. Don't have your chest out, like, I got my undershirt on, my chest is, I'm not up here with my chest out. I'm not up here, you see my penny line, you're not seeing all that stuff. Make sure your dress isn't see-through, put a slip on, you no know, dress bodice. Amen. Teach, love of God. So that's what my grandmother, that's what she taught a lot of the ladies, but, man, what were y'all taught? Were y'all taught on anything? What were y'all taught? The men? Yeah. Y'all didn't get that y'all didn't get that message on how to dress. Teach, woman of God. I'm asking a question. We were taught, we were taught. What were y'all taught? We were taught in the men's class. Y'all were taught in the women's But I need to know. <laughs> y'all weren't taught. They, 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 yeah. they, 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 they didn't talk about covering up. I mean, I didn't get, uh, I got taught how to tie Okay, tie. Okay. Okay, like presentable. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we got so many skinny jeans, because y'all weren't taught. Because <laughs> us women, if we can't wear tight clothing, men can't wear tight clothing either. Yeah, I agree. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Just want to put that out there. <laughs> so, spiritually, that needs to be done as well. There's that elder in the family that taught us how we are to look. Our father in heaven, he has two on how to conduct ourselves. That we are to conduct ourselves wholly in every situation. So yesterday, my husband and I, we were at this food truck. Um, it's called the, the potluck. Now you quiet because you're mad. <laughs> It's called the potluck, right? Yes, okay, the potluck. So they got the best Cajun wings, y'all. It's in South Boston. Uh, with the potluck ATX. Um, do it after church now, right now. But potluck ATX, and they got the best Cajun wings. They're in South Boston off of Mancheca, Mancheca. How you pronounce that street name? Well, it's two ways to pronounce it. or Okay. But that street. So they got the best Cajun wings. And the owner, he's actually from New Orleans. So y'all know the food is really good. And he was playing music. And, you know, it took me back to my college days. And the music that he was playing, it was, like, very explicit. It wasn't even the unexplicit. It, like, had every customer. And I'm just sitting there. And if I'm not careful, I know how I am. When I hear a certain song, I start move my head and I start dancing. Not dancing like that, but I just start moving. And so I had to like, hold up. I'm not conducting myself as holy, so let me just go sit in the vehicle, wait till my food is ready. <laughs> With your husband's <laughs> Put some gospel music on, some jazz, something, because that type of music is gonna take me to a place. And I have to remind myself that in our holy conduct, I don't, my ears, I have to be, I have to make sure what I'm listening to is it glorifying God when I hear certain music. Because I don't want that in my spirit. And I didn't realize how important this was until, um, it was a couple years ago uh, when I was picking Apostle Kenny from the airport. And we weren't, like, we weren't Facebook official, but we were official in the spirit. So we weren't, we were just, you know, courting. And so I picked him up from the airport and I'm playing some ratchet music. It was, it was bad. And I didn't think like, hey, I'm picking up 
my friend, like she's a pastor, like I shouldn't be playing this type of music in the car. I wasn't thinking that, I was thinking like when I, in the car, I like to play certain music. And it's like I didn't have any respect or honor for the man. And it was a Saturday evening. He had to speak the next day. And he politely asked me, like, hey, can we change the music? And I, you know, I took an offense. I was like, are you trying to change me? Because this is the type of music <laughs> that I like to listen to. And this is my vehicle. And I'm doing you a favor by picking you up. So, but thankfully, he didn't look down on me like others did during that time frame with their condemnation. But he basically was telling me, look at it from a different perspective. We're to live a consecrated life, not just right before we have to speak, not just right before a big church service or a big event, but live a consecrated lifestyle. Yeah. And maybe your issue is in music. Maybe it's what you're watching. And I'm speaking for myself, I don't know everybody else has struggled, but for me, when I was single, there was a point in time where I was like, okay, God, I'm going to uh, make this vow of celibacy. I'm going to give my body to you, serve you, glorify you with my body. And so I'm going to, you know, not do extracurricular activities that, come in, that doesn't come into alignment with what your word says, right? Mm -hmm. So there were certain TV shows, you know, that had sex scenes. One of those shows was Power, and that used to be my favorite TV show, but God, <laughs> whew, I had to stop watching it because certain scenes, it will take you to a place. And so I couldn't watch some of that stuff. And I'm married now, I'm 32 years old, I'm grown, and I still, if there's a sex scene that pops up, I still fast forward through it. Because I don't want to partake in anything that gratifies my flesh or cause my flesh to rise when I'm supposed to be satisfied with God, please him, serve him, and just glorify him with my body. That's holy conduct. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how old you get. My grandfather, um, the one that was here for the commissioning service, um, he used to be a heavy alcoholic. And he's been sober now for like more than probably almost 40 years now, he's been sober. And to this day, he can't even use certain mouthwashes because the alcohol content is so strong. And he's a pastor, an elder, he's up in age, and even he has to know his limitations that if I take the wrong mouthwash, I don't know what's gonna happen, so I, I have to avoid it. So it's really real, no matter how old you are, whether you are now or in the future, uh, growing up. All that is to say that our body is a temple of Holy Spirit. And it doesn't belong to us. And we are to glorify God and our, with our body and making sure that we're conducting ourselves in a holy way. But that mirror that I mentioned in James chapter 1, it represents transformation. The Word of God is like a mirror to make us like Christ. We aren't to bring him down and try to make him like us, but we should reflect God. Our identity should be found in Christ. So let's talk about identity. God created humans to have unique characteristics and a purpose. And he designed us to have, some of us have some things in common but all, overall, we need to be content with our lives through his will. So whatever we are pursuing, is it God's will? Are we living to please God or are we living to impress people? Yeah. We unfortunately found our identity in things and people, but it's no longer been found in God. So Satan and his influence has caused us to have a distorted view of ourselves. So remember um, at the fair or at the circus, they had this thing called the funhouse mirror? Like, so before escape rooms, there were, there was the house of mirrors. And it was like a maze-like puzzle where the mirrors are like an obstacle course and there's a bunch of glass paint planes. And it's a field with a lot of distorted mirrors which are actually curved. It's not a straight plane mirror like the ones that we have home at our homes, but they are curved. And to achieve the distorted effect that gives us a confusing 
reflection of ourselves. It's funny to look at, but you know, of course, if you're a child, you're young, it can be scary. Some of us, we don't have to go to the House of Mirrors at the fair to see the distorted view of ourselves. Some of us have it right in our homes, at our jobs, or other places. We look at it every day, and we deal with it every day, Satan, the accuser of brethren, telling us false lies about ourselves. Yes. Um, that you're not doing a good job as a parent. That you're not loved. And oh, God doesn't, God doesn't talk to you. God didn't choose you. You're not worthy. You can't do anything. You can't amount to anything. That's what Satan likes to put in our minds. So we have to quit buying into Satan's lies and buy into his word. If we fill our minds with our fill our minds and our hearts with the truth, then there'll be no room for Satan's lies. Amen. Just like for us who are parents, we affirm our children and tell them, you're smart, you're beautiful, you're handsome, you're capable, you're loved, you're a, you're a leader. We say that so that no matter what happens at that school, whether their classmates may try to tease them or make fun of them, they've already been built up because me as a parent, I've talked to my child and told them that you are this, so no matter what somebody else says, you know that's not true because you're hearing the truth here at home. Yes. That way they're not gonna be so easily moved because I've already built them up in the word of God. We have to do the same thing to ourselves. We discover our true identity the more we draw close to him. Because without God and without his word, we experience an identity crisis. Yeah. We don't know who we are. We don't know who we belong to. We find ourselves doing things that we never thought that we would be able to do. Yes. But God, he created us in his image. So like I mentioned, we aren't to bring him down and try to make him like us. Romans 12 tells us, do not, be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So why can we not be conformed because to this world? Because it's full of superficial junk. Yeah. Satan, he is the deceiver of the whole world. He disguises himself as an angel of light. He has blinded the minds of everybody, even unbelievers, to keep them from seeing the light, to keep them from seeing the glory of Christ. So to be transformed, we are to mature spiritually. Some of us, we haven't matured. We haven't evolved. We're not growing. We're stunted by our own growth because we're following the world. We feel like we gotta be part of the in crowd. And you know, everyone is doing this, everyone is doing that. But we, as his chosen people, we weren't called to the world. We were called to live according to God's standard. So who is going to stand up and declare his righteousness? Who's going to stand up and call a spade a spade and say, no, what you're doing, that's not of God. What you're doing is going to lead you down to a path of destruction. It says, be holy for I am holy. He has called you holy. You must also be holy in all of your conduct. That's Bible. First Peter 1, 15 through 17, be holy for I am holy. When was the last time that you looked at yourself lately? What do you see? Or what did you see? Yeah. Did you see self? Or did you see Christ? When are we going to take that hard look in the mirror and stop skipping over certain chapters in the Bible? Mm -hmm. It's easy to read the scriptures that encourage us that says, you know, God knows the plans that he has for me. It's easy to read, you know, with God, all things are possible. It's easy to read, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's easy to read those. Those are good, encouraging scriptures. But what about the scriptures that bring conviction and cause out sin? Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Committing sexual sin. Being an adulterer. You know that man ain't your husband, that you're an adulterer. You know that woman ain't your wife, you're an adulterer. 
fornication. We're supposed to save ourselves, be pure until we get married. Uncleanness, that's pornography. Quit lying to yourself and to your spouse, using it as a means of foreplay. That's uncleanness. And God is not pleased with that. Lewdness, that's being totally irresponsible and lacking self-control. Idolatry, worshiping false gods. There's only one and true living God. And he says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Your spouse is not your God. Your children, no matter how cute they are, they're not your God. Your job is not your God. Your education is not your God. Your money is not your God. Thou shalt have no other God before me. That's what God says. Yes. Sorcery. Taking part in witchcraft. Thinking smoking weed is going to get you closer to God. That's a sin. God's not pleased with that either. We have to quit, contem quit contaminating ourselves with other spirits. Thinking, oh, I need to get this high. No, you don't. Hatred. That's being hostile all the time. Hating people. Just being malicious for no reason. Contentions. You're causing trouble everywhere you go. Always want to argue. And then you wonder why nobody wants to deal with you. No one wants to deal with that argument of the spirit. Jealousy. Desiring what someone else has that's not meant for you. If that person has a house on a hill and now you're trying to get, but that's not what God has, has for you. It's okay to want nice things. It really is. But don't want the nice things because you see what someone else has. Outbursts of wrath. That's where you easily lose your temper. You don't have no self-control to keep your cool. You're easily moved every time. Selfish ambitions. You walk in here, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? But you're not living a life to please God. Dissensions. Causing people to argue and divide and be in separate groups. Heresies, just thinking people should follow your opinion. But what you're saying doesn't align up to the word of God. Even here at Hope Nation, the idea that you have doesn't line up to Hope Nation's vision. If it's not, then you're just trying to do your own thing. Envy, murderers, drunkenness. Where you have an intention to get so drunk so that you can't lose control. Orgies, having wild parties involving large amounts of alcohol and sex just to be a nuisance to others. See. All of that is sin. It's all in the Bible. See. Everywhere. Every sin. See. Galatians 5 tells us those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yes. I've been studying the book of Proverbs, and I know a lot of people, they like to just migrate to just chapter 31. But if you read the whole book, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Amen. And I've been reading it, and I don't want to be no foolish woman. I don't, I want to be wise. I don't want to be the one that's tearing down my house. I don't want to be the one that causes so many arguments in the house where my husband rather lives on the roof than to live in the house. That's in Proverbs. But we don't want to be that foolish woman that's stepping outside of our marriage to lure other men into our house while our husband is gone. That's also in Proverbs. But we should ask God, impart to me wisdom. And I was reading, um, who was I reading? John chapter 5. Yeah, John chapter 5. 
JC, come up if you want to. Jesus told the man, you are well now, but stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. If you're guilty of sin, confess your sins to the Lord and repent. Yes. Look in the mirror. Be transformed. Don't look back. I mentioned this last week in women's Bible study that Jesus came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. To change the way we live. God grants us repentance so that we may know the truth, that we may know him. God is wanting us to return to him. Backsliding is no longer just someone who isn't physically in the church. That's what they told us growing up. Oh, so-and-so, Sister Mary ain't been to church for three weeks. She, she done backslid. No, it's more than just that. You can still physically be here, but mentally you elsewhere. And to me, you might as well be gone. Why are you here if you mentally somewhere else? To backslide is to re relapse into error. God has told us to lay aside every weight and sin that easily causes us to fall into a trap. What you're doing may not be a sin, but it's a weight. It's keeping you away from God. And God is saying, come back to me. He's here. He shows up every time, but we are not, some of us are not engaging in him. And he's saying, engage in my presence. If you will find me in my presence, you will find joy. You will find liberty. You will find new life. You will find peace. But spend time with me. You got time for everyone else and everything else, but you don't spend time with me. I'm your first love. That's what God is saying. But you've been neglecting me. You don't even know my voice anymore when I speak to you. And you're trying to figure out what the next thing you should be doing, but have you sought first me? Yes. Quit seeking by hand is what the Lord is saying. Seek first me. Seek my face is what God is saying. I have chosen you, but you are still rejecting me. You pick up your cell phone more than you pick up my word, is what God is saying. You pick up that remote control to binge watch, but you won't pick up the Bible. You won't pick up my word. You pick up that sex toy, but you won't pick me up, is what the Lord is saying. But we have to quit making excuses, saying, oh, well, I'm not comfortable. But it's not about your comfort. Say that to Jesus when he was on the cross. And we have to quit looking at what everyone else is doing, but look at ourselves in the mirror is what God is wanting us to do. God is speaking to us, and he does not like being ignored. He wants us to do more than just listen to the word, but live this thing out. If we're not obeying God's commands, if we're not living what we have been commissioned to do, what we have been sent to do, then we are deceiving ourselves. And he has clearly told us, be not deceived. My prayer is that right now that we will submit to God. God, remove the scales from our eyes. God, we want to hear from you, God. Remove all the blinders, God. Remove the blind spots, God. But we want to hear you clearly, God. God, forgive us for rejecting you, God. Hallelujah. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for not seeing you, God. We want to be transformed, Lord, into your image, into your likeness, God. We want to be who you have called us to be, God. No longer will we walk around uh, just sleeping in, in our slumber, God. But God is telling us to wake up. He is calling us to wake up to be the standard. We can't have people come in here and they can't. They are looking at us and they're like, well, if you're acting like this, you're acting like just like the people that I just left from the club. But there's going to be a group of people that come here from different lifestyles and we have to be the standard. We have to let them know by our walks and how we are living that what you're doing is wrong. We don't have to condemn them, but by the way that we walk, 
how we walk and how we conduct ourselves as a holy, they're going to know by seeing us, by looking at us, that, oh, you are a follower of Christ. You are doing it this way, and I should be doing it too. Our lifestyle, how we walk, it should help convict others. Be not deceived. Be not deceived. Be not deceived. Hallelujah, God. Forgive us, O oh God. We repent, Lord. We no longer want to walk in error. We no longer want to miss the mark, God. But convict us, God, that we can lay aside every weight and every sin that gets in the way of us seeking you, God, of searching you, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Convict us, O oh God. Holy Spirit, let just rain on us right now, God. We receive you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. We receive you, God. No longer will we walk and reject you and reject what you are saying, God. And we cancel every plan of the enemy that tries to get in our ear and say that we are less than God. But God, we know that we have been chosen, that we are child, children of the King, God. No longer are we going to walk around as peasants. We are royalty, so we're going to continue to act like it, right? Amen. But I want to challenge you to invite at least at least one person, okay? But don't try that person that you keep.